A mental illness is a disease like many other diseases. Two out of every five people may experience a mental disorder in their lifetime. For one out of 17, the illness will be serious and disabling. Today, however, modern treatment, medicine and therapy can produce excellent outcomes, especially with early diagnosis and intervention. So why do so many people let fear, shame and stigma prevent them from seeking the care that will help them most? Queen's Public Television will explore these issues and more in this series, Understanding Mental Illness. In our daily lives, the challenges posed by mental illness often go unnoticed or buried, except for the occasional tragic headline. It's time for all of us to engage in a serious and sustained examination of the issues surrounding mental health care. The remarkable author Ellen Sachs knows what it's like to live with a mental illness. Here, she discusses her struggles at a recent TED Talks conference. Schizophrenia is a brain disease. Its defining feature is psychosis, or being out of touch with reality. Delusions and hallucinations are hallmarks of the illness. Delusions are fixed and false beliefs that aren't responsive to evidence, and hallucinations are false sensory experiences. For example, when I'm a psychotic, I often have the delusion that I've killed hundreds of thousands of people with my thoughts. I sometimes have the idea that nuclear explosions are about to be set off in my brain. Occasionally, I have hallucinations, like one time I turned around and saw a man with a raised knife. Imagine having a nightmare while you're awake. All of this springs from this organ that we call the brain, and that every thought, every feeling that we have, every word that I'm uttering to you now is based on some chemical reaction taking place in this organ called the brain. And that's a difficult concept in a way for us to accept. Everyone has seen a street person, unkempt, probably ill-fed, standing outside of an office building muttering to himself or shouting. This person is likely to have some form of schizophrenia. But schizophrenia presents itself across a wide array of socioeconomic status, and there are people with the illness who are full-time professionals with major responsibilities. Well, when we talk about the prognosis for this illness, if someone has a first episode, um, I, I think the prognosis can be quite good, that with the right treatment, there's a very good chance that the person will respond, um, will go into remission, so that there are not obvious signs or symptoms. And then with the right ongoing treatment, we'd like to bring about uh, what we call recovery, which means helping the person get back to work or back to school, back to being a homemaker or whatever it is that they want to do. And um, we, can't, we can't assure that in all cases, but we certainly think there's a good chance that people can go a long way towards recovery. At best, I was expected to live in abortion care and work at menial jobs. Fortunately, I did not actually enact that grave prognosis. Instead, I'm a chaired professor of law, psychology, and psychiatry at the USC Gould School of Law. I have many close friends, and I have a beloved husband, Will, who's here with us today. Thank you. One of the things that I think is important to recognize when we talk about the, the stigma that's associated with mental illness and, and the misunderstanding that we still confront is that many people don't recognize that this is largely a brain disease and that people who do develop this illness um, do demonstrate abnormalities on neuroimaging, for example. So by that we mean mag magnetic resonance imaging or, or, or CAT scans, computerized axial tomography. And um, it, I think it was a very important advance to be able to show that there were actually brain abnormalities in people who develop these illnesses, as well as demonstrating that there's a very, very strong genetic component. So these are biological illnesses. Over time, it became uh, apparent there were some uh, landmark studies initially uh, that were uh, conducted uh, in the early uh, uh, 80s, uh, late 70s, that showed that uh, individuals with schizophrenia, for example, had these uh, abnormalities. Uh, for example, um, their uh, ventricles were enlarged. And uh, since that time, uh, subsequent studies have looked at brain structure um, using uh, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a more uh, advanced uh, technique compared to uh, computerized tomography. 
and they were interested in looking at uh, different brain structures um, that uh, were thought to play a role in the neurobiology of schizophrenia. What the technique allows us to do is actually map out those uh, connectivity uh, regions and get a better understanding of how this could be defective in patients with schizophrenia um, compared to healthy controls. The studies that we did uh, demonstrated essentially that these abnormalities were present in patients with schizophrenia but not in individuals, not in healthy individuals. And um, the important point is that uh, the abnormalities were evident in individuals experiencing a first episode of schizophrenia. And I think we're getting a better sense of how they may contribute uh, to these um, um, deficits, including um, um, symptoms, positive symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, uh, negative symptoms, um, uh, and, and, and really provide us with a, a better understanding of how schizophrenia um, is a, a defect in white matter connectivity. I think mental illness always presents a challenge for people because to consider the possibility that something might go wrong with our brains or our minds, which in a sense are really both springing out of this organ called the brain, is very frightening to people because the, the mind represents ourselves, our fundamental core. And the thought that something could go wrong with that means we're no longer who we are. So what exactly are the chances we will encounter a mental illness? The average family is going to have someone who's been affected or will be affected by some type of either mental illness or addictive disorder. And many of these illnesses begin in, in childhood or adolescence. They can interfere with people's development, with their ability to go to school or to go to work or to become a homemaker or to have social relationships or what have you. When people think about mental illness, they don't think about children and adolescents. They think about young adults, middle-aged folks, older adults, when the reality is what we've come to understand is that childhood is a carefree, happy time is mythical. And actually, a high percentage of young people struggle with a variety of behavioral and emotional disturbances that really deserve professional attention. And the current figures are maybe one in five young people will meet criteria for at least one psychiatric disorder before the age of 18. These are very, very important illnesses. In fact, psychiatric illnesses account for a tremendous proportion of the disability that we see in the world. And when we talk about disability, I'm talking about people being unable to work or to go to school or to do the things that they want to do. Um, so from a public health standpoint, these are tremendously important illnesses, yet they still don't have the understanding and awareness in the minds of the public that they should. And I think that's, that's an area where we still need to make a lot of progress. Are we making any progress toward understanding what causes mental illness? We don't know what causes schizophrenia. There are a lot of theories, a lot of hypotheses out there. Uh, we do think that at, at its basic level, genetics plays a role. Something in the DNA sequence of individuals places them at greater risk for developing schizophrenia. What that specific DNA sequence is, where it occurs, what the crucial timings are, we're still working to, work, we're still working to figure out. When we ask ourselves the question, um, you know, what does cause this illness to develop, it's complex. I mean, there's a very strong genetic component. There may be environmental influence as well, as well uh, stress. Um, in some cases, uh, the illness begins much earlier in life than in other cases. Now, we don't fully understand all of the factors that account for these differences, but we, we do believe that it, there's a strong genetic component, that there are biological factors probably in the way the brain develops, and that that process might start even in, in early childhood. People always ask the question, uh, are mental illnesses genetic? Are they environmental? They really are a combination. What's probably inherited is a vulnerability to mental illness. And then probably a number of developmental issues 
set that off, stresses at key points in development, and those key points can go all the way back to the environment in the mother's womb right up through childhood and adolescence. Uh, some interesting research has shown that certain viruses contracted during pregnancy by uh, mothers increase the risk of um, schizophrenia in their offspring. We also know that things you might not expect, like the age of the father, can increase the risk of schizophrenia in offspring. So basically we're following a whole bunch of promising leads in the, in the psychiatric community, but I think we're going to end up with a combination of genetic and environmental influences. People aren't really born with schizophrenia, but people may be born with an increased risk for developing schizophrenia. Other things have to probably take place before you're fully sure that someone's going to develop schizophrenia. Environmental factors, stress, many of the things have to interact uh, with the genetic code for someone to develop this disorder. That's a difficult concept in a way for us to accept because it, it calls into question uh, many, many things. And when we consider the possibility that something could go wrong in the brain, it's very scary. So I think that's part of the problem that we have to overcome is people's understanding of this and their comfort in thinking about what the brain is, what it means, what impact it has on, on our overall being, and what it means when something goes wrong with the brain. Patients with schizophrenia can suffer from a, a vast array of different kinds of symptoms. The positive symptoms are the hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations are seeing things or hearing things that aren't really there. So you might see somebody in the street who's yelling out uh, at the street or where no one seems to be. They may be hearing voices and are actually responding to those voices. Those are hallucinations, part of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. Delusions are believing things that are not really true perhaps believing that there's an organized conspiracy against you. This can make your life very difficult to lead if you think everyone around you is conspiring against you to do you harm and can lead to a very sheltered and uh, uncomfortable existence. Moreover, there's something called the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. These are things that aren't, are, are not there. The failure to feel emotion, the lack of empathy, uh, lack of volition, lack of desire, inability to enjoy things, inability to, to love, inability to have social interactions. These negative symptoms actually play a greater role in determining how well a patient is going to get along in society. Because you can't interact with others, have meaningful social interactions. You can see how it would be very difficult to get a job, to meet a loved one, to have a satisfying and full life. We don't always have the community resources and the community services that, that should be available. I mean, that's always a challenge. Uh, I do believe that people with mental illness don't necessarily get the systematic care that they need and that our society has not fully come to grips with the challenge that mental illness presents. Uh, there's a lot of ambivalence about these illnesses. There's still a lot of stigma associated with mental illness. We've made progress, but we still have a long way to go. But the notion that, um, that these pe people cannot be managed Appropriately in, appropriately in the community is wrong. The fact that society hasn't succeeded in doing it is a problem, and the reality right now is that prisons and jails uh, are housing more people with mental illness than are psychiatric hospitals. But that just means that society hasn't figured out how to allocate resources, and there's a lot of confusion about what is a mental illness and what isn't a mental illness. During the next year, I would spend five months in a psychiatric hospital. At times, I spent up to 20 hours in mechanical restraints. Arms tied, arms and legs tied down, arms and legs tied down with a net tied tightly across my chest. I never struck anyone, I never harmed anyone, I never made any direct threats. If you've never been restrained yourself, you may have a benign image of the experience. There's nothing benign about it. The history of uh, society's treatment of patients with schizophrenia is not a, a very uh, reassuring one. Uh, in the earliest times, uh, many people believed that patients with schizophrenia had been possessed, perhaps, by devils or outside forces and were essentially treated as uh, uh, outsiders from society and excluded from society and perhaps even tortured in some cases. 
Uh, after that, we had a period of time where patients were really hospitalized or institutionalized chronically, perhaps for their entire lives uh, in, in the hospital system. And really, these hospitals were not the most modern of hospitals as we think about them today, but were essentially back wards where patients were being warehoused. More recently, however, with the understanding that this is a biological illness, there seems to be less stigma associated with schizophrenia. But even with that, uh, many patients with schizophrenia are homeless or in the prison system. And so society still has really not met the standard, I think, of treating our patients with the dignity that they deserve. In terms of the neurobiological findings, I think there have been a lot of uh, implications for um, uh, stigma and uh, mental illness. It's important to emphasize that individuals uh, shouldn't uh, blame themselves uh, for um, these uh, psychiatric disorders, um, that there are um, identifiable abnormalities um, evident very early in the course of illness. Um, they uh, are not influenced uh, by medication, um, and it's important to uh, emphasize that. It's really not been, been really well emphasized. And in fact, some psychotherapies um, actually do emphasize the uh, fact that um, these disorders are a, um, uh, have something to do with uh, a disruption in the brain. So a key element in this is, is making the right diagnosis. Um, there's, there's no reason why someone with a mental illness should end up in, in a jail or a prison instead of a hospital. And that means that somewhere along the line, these, these people are not getting the right diagnosis. They're not getting early intervention and early treatment and they end up in the criminal justice system and you know that's that's a huge problem these diseases these disorders are biological disorders just like many other disorders we have in medicine diabetes hypertension these are chronic illnesses we don't fully understand the reasons for these illnesses but we understand there's a biological basis for them there's no reason to stigmatize people who have diabetes or hypertension just like there's no need for stigma associated with chronic mental disorders like schizophrenia We've made a lot of progress, I think, in terms of knowing how to use medications more effectively, but we still have many patients who don't respond to a first-line treatment, and then we have to make a decision as to what other treatments we should uh, recommend to the patient. One of the most um, efficacious treatments is a drug called clozapine that we were involved in developing but clozapine is still grossly underutilized because a lot of clinicians are a little bit afraid of it. They, it does have side effects, it does have to be monitored, but for those patients who benefit from it, it can have a pretty dramatic impact on their lives. One thing we work on extensively with people is just a recognition that they have an illness, the same way somebody with high blood pressure has an illness or diabetes has an illness, and that they're going to need to pay attention to that illness, to treat it, to work with it if they're going to uh, be able to do well out in the community outside of the hospital. Yeah, I, th I think one of the key advances that we've made over the past um, several decades is that modern day treatment recognizes the complexity of these illnesses. That we may have an illness which is largely a brain disease, but it also requires very active psychosocial treatment, family therapy, psychoeducation, vocational rehabilitation, supportive housing. It's, it's critical that all of these things be integrated in a systematic way. And I think we've made a lot of progress in understanding both how to do that and also what impact that can have on the individual. Should we fear people who have a mental illness? We know that psychiatric illness in and of itself does not make someone more dangerous than anybody else. But untreated or combined with substance abuse, it can increase the level of dangerousness. So I think that's a good question of whether or not people should be frightened uh, in the general population of individuals who have schizophrenia. And, and, and the short answer is uh, no. Um, you know, I think uh, what you might be referring to are individuals with schizophrenia who have demonstrated uh, violence, uh, which is really only a small uh, subgroup of individuals with schizophrenia. Um, again, I think there's the stigma that's attached to it. Um, these are individuals that are, um, you know, not um, functioning well. Um, they're, you know, out of mainstream society. Uh, and so, again, of course, there's a certain stigma attached to it that makes it very difficult to relate 
to individuals like this. So uh, the short answer is, is, is no. There's concern, of course, in the general population sometimes that patients with schizophrenia may be a danger to themselves or to others. And there's a slight increased risk in some cases uh, of, of dangers to themselves or others. But for the most part, a patient with schizophrenia is simply somebody who suffers from a mental disorder and is at no greater risk of harming anyone uh, than somebody else, perhaps, in the general population. All the studies that have been done on violence in the mentally ill have shown that except for certain cases of untreated mental illness or mental illness combined with substance abuse, the average person, even with a serious mental illness, is no more of a danger uh, to other people than anybody else. When you get a sensational media case like uh, Lochner, you know, and his picture plastered, that horrendous picture plastered all over the, uh, the newspapers, that sets us back a good deal. But remember, during the course of this case unwinding, how many violent acts have been committed by people with no mental illness whatsoever? They tend to not make the headlines the way that the mentally ill do. We still struggle with a lot of misunderstanding about mental illness in general, and particularly an illness like schizophrenia. People don't know what it is. They are f frightened by it or threatened by it. They might think that patients with schizophrenia are generally dangerous, which is not true. Uh, they might believe that uh, these patients should not be living in their community. Uh, we need to overcome those misunderstandings. People need to recognize that this is an illness like any other illness. Uh, the brain is an organ like any other organ. Modern approaches to treatment bear little resemblance to the past. In today's system, someone who um, is seeking treatment could enter treatment through an outpatient setting. That might be at a local community mental health center or one of our clinics. We run a number of clinics throughout the borough. So they might get involved purely as an outpatient, get the treatment they need, have their condition stabilized, get both medication treatment and ongoing support and therapy, um, and really do very well. Another way people enter the system is through emergency rooms. And that's when you have an illness that's been ignored, that's reached a point where it's reached crisis proportions, and the person presents behavior that looks like it might endanger themselves or even endanger other people. So if someone presents to an emergency room, they may end up in the psychiatric unit of a general hospital and may have just a short stay there and be discharged into the community to follow up their care in the community. Or if their illness is really not responding to initial treatment, is very complicated or refractory, they may get transferred to a state hospital like ours. And here, they may be here for a few months or even longer while their condition is stabilized and while we put together an outpatient plan that's really going to work for them. And for some people that may involve not just going to a clinic, it may involve a day program, it may involve what's called an intensive case manager who works with that patient to ensure that they're getting the care that they need. We might not have the same depth of understanding as we do about, say, certain kinds of heart disease or kidney disease or what have you. But I think despite that, we are still able to treat these conditions in ways that are highly effective. And I think in many cases our treatments are as effective as they are in other branches of medicine. So in that sense, I don't think that we are that far behind. We still don't have laboratory tests or blood tests that we can do or x-rays that we can do to make a definitive diagnosis. So in that sense, we are lagging behind some other areas of medicine. But I think we're a lot closer than people sometimes realize. 
I think anyone suffering from a chronic mental disorder like schizophrenia, or anyone who has a loved one suffering from a chronic mental disorder like schizophrenia, should feel a tremendous amount of hope at this point in time. These new technologies, these new, these new research strategies, I think will really revolutionize how we treat disorders like schizophrenia in the not too distant future. And with more research, more emphasis on understanding the biology of these illnesses, I think we'll take the next step to better improve treatments for these devastating disorders. I think it's, it's particularly important for the audience to understand that if someone thinks that they might have a mental illness or psychiatric disorder, or they think that someone whom they're close to might have such a condition, that the biggest mistake they can make is to ignore it and pretend that it's not there. That these illnesses are treatable, but they're much more treatable if they're treated early and appropriately. And I think people get frightened by the uncertainty, by the stigma, by the myth. And I think we need to really help the public understand that the key thing about these illnesses is recognizing them and getting the right treatment. So let me share some final thoughts. We need to invest more resources into research and treatment of mental illness. The better we understand these illnesses, the better the treatments we can provide, and the better the treatments we can provide, the more we can offer people care and not have to use force. Also, we must stop criminalizing mental illness. It's a national tragedy and scandal that the, that the LA County Jail is the biggest psychiatric facility in the United States. American prisons and jails are filled with people who suffer from severe mental illness, and many of them are there because they never received adequate treatment. I could have easily ended up there or on the streets myself. A message to the entertainment industry and to the press. On the whole, you've done a wonderful job uh, fighting stigma and prejudice of many kinds. Please continue to let us see characters in your movies, your plays, your columns who suffer with severe mental illness. Portray them sympathetically and portray them in all the richness and depth of their experience as people and not as diagnoses. Recently, a friend posed a question. If there were a pill I could take that would instantly cure me, would I take it? The poet, Reiner Mary Rilke, was offered psychoanalysis. He declined, saying, don't take my devils away because my angels may flee too. My psychosis, on the other hand, is a waking nightmare in which my devils are so terrifying that all my angels have already fled. So would I take the, medica the pill in an instant? That said, I don't wish to be seen as regretting the life I could have had if I'd not been mentally ill, nor am I asking anyone for their pity. What I rather wish to say is that the humanity we all share is more important than the mental illness we may not. What those of us who suffer with mental illness want is what everybody wants. In the words of Sigmund Freud, to work and to love. Thank you. In the past, people with mental illness faced a lengthy stay in an institution. Today, many people receive effective treatment in local clinics while remaining in their home and community. Please watch as we explore these modern alternatives in our next episode, Community-Based Treatment. <laughs>